Thank you, my Jewish learning. It's always so fun to do this and be with you all. So many familiar friends and some new ones I see too. Um, actually, uh, what Julie didn't know is that my bio is slightly out of date because this week we moved house from Beit Zayat to like the next village over, which is called Motza Elite. Uh, so Motza, fascinating fun fact to you. Uh, you may, if you know your uh, rabbinic texts about the four species, you may randomly remember Motza is the name of the place where the willow used to be found that was used in the temple. Um, so that's where I live. And uh, there's a few willow trees around, which is nice. Um, so nice to be with so many of you, I see from all over the place. And we are going to uh, look at the source sheet. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share the screen. And as usual, please have your comments and questions. Uh, please put them in the chat and I'll see them. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to interact with them in between reading your source and talking about it. I'll like come back together and just see what everyone else is saying and thinking. So I'll get your responses. So Chodesh Tov, a good new month to all of you. We, we, uh, we started celebrating this, uh, this new moon, this new month already yesterday. And tonight in Israel, we already began the night, is, is actually officially the first day of the month for real. So I wish all of you a very good one. Let's find out a little bit about what this month of ER is all about. I'm gonna share my screen so you can see the source sheet. So ER doesn't have a festival. And you know, usually in our, in our learning, we focus on the festival, which is often on the full moon of the month in our calendar, as like the climax of the energy of the month. The, the festival often tells us everything we need to know about the spiritual work of the month. Instead of that model, ER has the Omer. And some of you may know, some of you may not, the Omer actually spans seven weeks. And it's seven weeks that we count between the second night of Passover, of Pesach, we recently had and Shavuot, the festival that's coming up, Pentecost, where we celebrate the revelation of Mount Sinai. So those seven weeks or 49 days are counted day by day in the traditional liturgy. And every day has come to correspond to a special quality in the Kabbalistic tree of life. And in fact, a combination of qualities. So looking at the source sheet now, you'll see this, uh, I'm gonna expand this little diagram here. Some of you may have seen this before, some not. This is the Kabbalistic tree of life, or at least one, this is a pretty good version of it. There are lots of different versions. And um, what we do during the seven weeks of the Omer is we focus on the seven lower qualities. So beginning with Chesed on the right, well, there is, yeah, it is, it is the right. I uh, you know it's drawn as if you might think it might not be, but it is. Chesed, and then we go to Guvura, and then actually just now we're going to the week of Tiferet, and then Netzach, and then Hod, and then Yesod, and then Shekhinah or Malchut. So you may be familiar with these names, you may never have heard them before, it's fine. We're, everything, we're, everything that we discuss in Hebrew or Kabbalese, we're gonna you know, explain what it is too. So the first week of the Omer is Chesed, that's loving kindness, oneness, unity. The second week is Gevura, which is boundaries or severity. The third week, Tiferet, we're going into it now, is a week of harmonious, beautiful, bringing those together, a harmonious synthesis of chesed and gavur. So the right balance of oneness and boundaries of generosity and severity. Then netzach is uh, eternity, endurance, determination, persistence. Hod is humility, withdrawal, restraint. Also allowing for potential to be fulfilled. Yesod is bonding, sharing and so on. And shechina is manifestation. Uh, now, there's a lot more to say about all of these. Indeed, I literally uh, have taught a whole class on them and you could teach many classes on them, uh, on each of them. Uh, but for now, that's just a tiny overview. And what we're gonna do to begin the class is to look at what, what, why we are counting these qualities at all. Like where this practice comes from of counting these seven weeks and how they then relate to these qualities. So we're gonna rewind, first of all, to our oldest source, we have that talks about counting this time, which is in the Torah, in the book of Vayikra, Leviticus, and talking in a section that talks about all of the different festivals we have, Parshat and more. And it says, from the day on which you bring the sheaf of elevation offering, the day after the Sabbath, you shall count off seven weeks. They must be complete. You must count until the day after the seventh week, 50 days, then you shall bring an offering of new grain to the eternal. So what's it talking about is, 
on Pesach, on the second day of Pesach specifically, that is the day after the Sabbath. That's how, that's how our tradition interprets that, that phrase, the day after the Sabbath. It means the day after the first day of Pesach, so the second day of Passover. On that day, the second day of Passover, our ancient spiritual ancestors, the ancient Israelites, brought a barley offering. It doesn't say here explicitly that it's barley, but that's what it is. It's a barley offering because this is the time that the barley crop was um, harvested. This is when it was ready at Pesach time. And barley was used as an animal food. And then the seven weeks that we count are seven weeks between the barley crop being ready and harvested and then the, and then the wheat crop finally being ready on Shavuot. The, the, uh, the festival of Shavuot is associated with wheat and bread in many, many different ways. The sacrifice offered on Shavuot, the special sacrifice that's unique to that festival is loaves of bread, as opposed to Pesach Passover when we're not allowed to have bread, we're not allowed to have leaven. So we, we have matzah, the flat bread, without leaven instead. So it's like a journey from flat matzah to bread. And if any of you are familiar with the Book of Ruth, that's the story with the Megillah that we read on the festival of Shavuot. The Book of Ruth, as you may know, happens in a place called Beit Lechem, the house of bread, and is all about bread and the harvest of wheat and so on. Uh, Excuse me, that's my landlord who completely disregarded my instructions not to interrupt me. Okay, so what we're going to see now is a commentary from Ranban, uh, not Ranban, but Nachman it is, not my mind is, who is a great, also a great medieval commentator and Kabbalist. And he's going to tell us a little bit about why we're counting this period of 49. And as the, uh, the Torah there says in that quote we just read, 49 days, seven weeks, and also mentions the 50th day. The 50th day is actually Shavuot, actually the festival that we're counting up to. So Ramban's going to give us a key piece of context for why the numbers involved are special. And then maybe after this, I'll just come back to all of you and uh, see your comments and questions and check we're all on the same page. So Nachmanides says in his commentary on the Torah, seven is the chosen among days, i.e. Shabbat, the seventh day, right? That's, that's the most special day. And years, i.e. the sabbatical year. So the seventh day is Shabbat, the seventh year of the sabbatical year, seven is obviously a special number. And also of the, of the sabbatical year, so, i.e. the Jubilee. So you may know, you may not, that not only do we have a sabbatical year every seven years, but also we have a cycle of seven sabbatical years. So we, we have like seven years, the seventh of which is a sabbatical year, and then we have another seven and so on. We have seven of those until we get up to 49. And then we actually have a 50th year, which is a jubilee year. And that's where the original idea of a jubilee being the 50th year came from. And on the, both the sabbatical year and more so on the jubilee year, slaves are freed and debts are released and all that kind of thing. So that's where, that's where that whole idea came from. So as Ramban here is telling us that we have the seventh day, we have the seventh year, we have the seven cycles of seven years to get up to the Jubilee. So this is all, he says, one matter, which is the secret of the days of the world from in the beginning and to and to, and then they were completed. What's he talking about? So in the beginning is a quote, as it says there from Genesis 1.1, and then they were completed is a quote from Genesis 2.1. That is the whole that those quotes span and bracket the whole first chapter of Genesis, the book of creation, the first book of the Torah. And he's telling us that the seven days of creation are, it's not a coincidence that that number seven is then reappearing everywhere else in the examples he's given. He's saying this is a foundation of, the, of our existence in this world. One way, one way of thinking about it is like, this is the spiritual DNA of the world. It's built in sevens, essentially. Like if you put the spiritual microscope close enough up to everything in this world, you'll find out that everything is basically built on sevens, especially it seems things to do with time. So, what, so to him, it's, it's not a coincidence, it's not random, it's not arbitrary that we're counting this cycle of seven weeks and currently up to 49. This is indicative of the structure of creation itself. I'll just come back together and just see if anyone has any questions or comments on this, and then we'll, we'll carry on. Okay. Oh, great. So let's see. 
Uh, Steve says, do you think it's just a coincidence this month is a turning point for COVID, a month of healing, turning back to normal, which coincides with a month of ER, which time of healing? Uh, Steve, that's a lovely question and a beautiful intention. Actually, I'll just explain a little bit more what Steve is referring to. There's a lovely uh, rabbinic reading of the name of our month, which I'll, I'll just uh, put in the chat in Hebrew so everyone can uh, see what he's referring to. So in the name, in the name of our month, as I've just written in the chat, is Aleph Yud Yud Resh. And there's a rabbinic reading which says that the Aleph, it's an acronym, but that the Aleph stands for Ani, I, and that the Yud Yud is, that stands for God's name. That's sometimes how we write God's name. And then the Resh at the end, the last letter, stands for Rofecha. There's a verse in the Torah in Exodus where God says, Ani Hashem Rofecha. I am, I am a God, your healer. So then this month, when we're counting the Omer and working on these qualities in ourselves, has come to be identified also as a month of healing in that way. So Steve, I certainly hope so. I certainly hope it continues to be a time of healing. Um, uh, Ellen says, no festival this month for Pesach Sheni, and also like the Omer, because of that's absolutely right, Helen. Ellen. Yeah, we're, you know, there isn't time to cover everything in detail, but I do have a class on, on those things. If, if anyone wants to uh, be in touch with me, you're welcome to. I'm just, uh, you know, trying to, cover the the um, it's, it's hard enough to do that in one class um but thanks for thanks for pointing that out um let's do a little bit more together let's go back to the sheet and we'll see a little bit more about why why this time is a special opportunity for healing and growth let me share my screen again so so our next source is from Rav Chaim Vital uh, he was, as it says, uh, the foremost disciple of the Arizal, all right, Isaac Luria. So these were all the great Kabbalists who lived in Sfat in northern Israel in the 1500s. And they gave us things like the Friday night prayer service, Kabbalah Shabbat, and many of the favorite songs and poems that we read and sing on Shabbat were written by them. And uh, also, to be honest, they were, they were just very influential. You know, Rabbi Isaac Luria reshaped Kabbalah so much that people sometimes talk about Lurianic Kabbalah as like basically being most of modern Kabbalah. So, uh, you know, very, very influential over everything that came after. And this is what he said about our period now, about what we're doing right now. He said, the redemption from Egypt had to be performed at that very moment, supernaturally, taking them out from slavery to freedom. After they left, there was no need for this anymore. So everything returned to its original nature to enter into each level until the festival of Shavuot. So this is actually a great overview of what we're doing with the Omer here. And we're going to see a few other sources unpack this idea more. Seder night, the first night of Pesach, the night that our ancient spiritual ancestors were taken out from slavery in a flash. They, they were given a magical extra supernatural boost, according to the way the Kabbalah understands it, from slavery to freedom. But after that, things went back to normal, meaning that they were no longer being given this incredible help from above to achieve things that they didn't deserve. Because really that's how the tradition sees the, the moment of liberation from Egypt. It sees us as receiving liberation, even though we were undeserving in some ways, even though we weren't really mature enough. So let, let's read a little bit more from the Arizo and then a uh, later Kabbalist, and then we'll understand what this means about the period we're in right now. So from Shah Kavanaugh, also from the Arizal and his student, Rabbi Vital, during these 49 days, it is good for a person to intend to repair all that they have wronged in relation to the seven Sifir Ra. For example, during the first week, they should intend to repair whatever they have wronged or damaged in relation to the Sifir Ra of Chesed, that's loving kindness or loving oneness or unity. In the second week, they should intend to repair what they have wronged or damaged in relation to the Sephirah of Kibura and so on through the seven weeks. So this is actually, this is uh, the original primary source for this practice that we have of working on these qualities in ourselves. And as you, as we, you can see, it's a relatively recent practice. You remember, we're talking about Kabbalists in the 1500s. So this is not actually something that goes all the way back to our ancient tradition, at least as far as we can tell from written sources. But as you may know, it's become fairly widespread in many Jewish communities. And there are many wonderful books you can buy about it. If you Google it, if you haven't already, you know, books to help you grow through the Omer, you'll find many, many different companions and guides to help you do that, going through all of these qualities in turn. So 
how does this relate to Pesach and the journey we're on, I think is spelled out most clearly by this next source, the Avodah Yisrael, who's actually a Hasidic master. The Hasidic masters took Kabbalah and applied it a little bit more specifically to the human condition, a little bit more in psychological language. To see what he says. The Avodah Yisrael, he says, on the first night of Pesach, all of the great healings were illuminated in one moment in order to take the Israelites out from the iron furnace of the 49 levels of impurity to the 49 levels of sanctity. So let's uh, translate that from Kabbalese to English. We were, the, the Kabbalists see the, our human existence as on a scale um, from minus 49, which is very bad, up to positive 49, which is very good. And if you go down to minus 50, you're completely lost, you no longer exist. And if you go up to plus 50, you have achieved unity with the divine. So most of us exist, well, all of us exist between negative 49 and plus 49, spiritual levels. The Kabbalists say that we were on the 49th level of impurity, that is negative 49, minus 49, when we were in Egypt. As I said before, we did not deserve to be liberated, but we get this big magic, supernatural, extra, nice boost, that's chesed, that's, that's God's kindness from God to free us, to take us out. And it gave us this magical boost all the way up to that plus 49, which is amazing, right? We went all the way up from negative 49 to plus 49, but just, it was temporary. And this is the meaning of, he goes on, for you departed from the land of Mitzrayim in haste. In this way, it was not from our side, as the Zohar explains, it was like an engagement party in the bride-to-be's father's house. So imagine, Someone's getting engaged and they can't afford to make the engagement party themselves. So they have the engagement party in the bride-to-be's father's house. Actually, probably a very common situation. But the point is, the bride-to-be's father is still the owner of the house and the boss over the whole situation. And the groom, who is the protagonist here in this example, the girl of the earring, the groom is not paying for the party. He's not hosting the party. He hasn't really earned the party. He's, he's being given something out of the generosity of the father of the bride. So that is us leaving Egypt. Therefore, he goes on, after you see our Mitzrayim, that's leaving Egypt, they needed to purify their character traits little by little through their spiritual work until Shavuot. So one way I heard this explained really clearly is we get given this huge treasure. We get given like this amazing huge chest of gleaming gold and silver and diamonds and lots of beautiful things or you know, translate it to whatever you actually like a very big part of things that you like very much, but we have no idea what's actually inside those things. We just get given this thing. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's not really ours in any way. And then what we have to do in these 49 days is take each item from that big gift we've been given and actually make it ours. And that's what it means to purify each of our character traits one by one in this period is to take this amazing gift we were given of being liberated and actually integrate it into ourselves. Let's come back together. I'd love to hear any questions or responses to any of that. Anyone have any thoughts? Well, if I'm not provoking some responses, I feel like I'm not doing my job. Oh, good, that's something. There you go. Uh, so if counting the Omer is 50 days, is the structure assuming we're all starting at zero? Ah, great question, Elizabeth. <laughs> the rabbis, oh, and there's another question, Joy, I didn't see, so I'll come back to that one. Um, so the rabbis have a lot of fun, actually, playing with, is it 49 or is it 50? And the bottom line in practice comes out that we're always working with 49 and the 50th is always beyond. And in, in this case, in, in our calendar, the 50th day is the festival of revelation when we hopefully are going to open to a whole new beginning in our spiritual relationship. So the fit, so the, uh, we're actually counting 49 and then the 50th is like a whole new, whole new thing. And Mel says, is, this, is the Jewish people as a whole or each of us always fluctuating between negative 49 and 49? Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Individually and collectively, that's, that's where we exist. Exactly. Cheryl says, will you discuss how the facets of each quality was created? Um, yeah, I can discuss that. Okay. Um, uh, you know, as much as <laughs> I can refer to the, the couple of uh, literature which discusses that anyway. Um, so... Let's talk about um, the creation myth for a moment of, of Lurianic Kabbalah. What I, Rabbi Isaac Luria says, this is how the world was created. He 
He says, um, the Ein Sof, the Infinite One, wanted to share and give and pour love and light and have a relationship. But to do that, first of all, the Ein Sof, the Infinite One, had to contract itself, had to do Tsim Sum. Um, because if, if the Ein Sof, if the Infinite One was just everything, there would be nothing to have a relationship with. So first it had to contract itself. And this is a very important model for us to have a healthy relationship. We can't have a healthy relationship if we are taking up all the space. So we have to contract to make room for others. So the Ein Sof contracts to make room for other stuff. And then the first thing to be created actually was these sephirot, these qualities, which are like gateways or portals for divine love and light to then pour into the rest of the universe. Unfortunately, what happens is those gateways and portals, those sephirot, those qualities, don't know how to share the light and let it come through them. So they break. When the, when the God's love and love, light pours into them, they break. And as a result, we live in a universe which is made up of little sparks of God's love and light hidden by broken shards of these broken vessels. And so for the Kabbalists, that's the whole universe. It's just God's love hidden. So the, the, the whole of our existence is about going through the world, trying to find the good in things, trying to find the sparks of God and the sparks of goodness, which are, which are concealed, but our job is to find them and raise them up to their source. So that's, and then, yeah, more than that, I, I don't think I can uh, go into now, but that's, that's kind of the, you know, the origin myth of the Sephira. Um, I'm going to go back to the sheet, but please keep your questions and comments coming, and I will continue to check back in with you. Our next, next source is actually a very, very quick, short one. Some of you may be wondering, the question may have arisen in you, you know, why 49? Although we kind of addressed it with that uh, teaching from Nachmanides, but I just thought this, this little snippet from Rav Sadok would go in here was helpful just to tie it all together. He points out, because of everything we've learned before about the whole of time, the whole of time in our world being built on sevens, so as he says, 49 is always a complete purification, meaning he's also saying, you know, when we go through the 49 years of that cycle of sabbatical years I mentioned before to get to the Jubilee, you've really gone through something. If you go through that cycle with intention, then, then you've really, you know, if you work on yourself during that time, then you really go through something. So if we work on all of these um, qualities in relation to each other, then we also completely purify ourselves. Actually, I should just explain that for anyone not familiar. I'm just going to flick back up to the top of the page just uh, to, to explain how it works. So as I said, we're working during the Omer with the seven lower qualities, which are now you can see here. And the way it works is the first day of the first week is how this quality of Chesed, the first one on the right, how it relates to itself. Then the second day is how it relates to the second quality of Gurura, and the third day is how it relates to the third quality, and so on. So every single day of the 49 days has a different combination of qualities that we're working on in that day. And, and it's, it's a very beautiful and powerful thing. And when you, if and when you see the literature, you know, the books which say, here's how to count the Yomah and grow through the Yomah, then you'll see that's what they focus on. Like, what does it mean to have these qualities in combination with each other? How do you get them in a healthy balance, essentially? So let's, let's move on and we'll see a bit more about our month specifically and, and how in our tradition it, it really is uh, on so many levels the perfect time for this, this healing that we're talking about, this purification of what's inside us and how it's very centered on the heart specifically. And I should just say heart, heart in, um, in Jew speak, in Hebrew, in, in biblical Hebrew and in rabbinic Hebrew, heart... Um, Sometimes people will translate it actually only as mind, like they, they actually literally, you know, the Hebrew will say lev, heart, and people will translate it in English as mind. But that's a mistranslation. But also heart doesn't only mean heart. Heart, heart, I might, I think a good translation of it very often, or people use it differently at different times, very often it means mind, heart, or heart, mind. Um, so it, meaning it's both our thoughts and our feelings. So that when we use it in Hebrew, that's, it's like acknowledging the, the give and take and the, the fluidity between our thoughts and our feelings. So let's see, Sefi Yitzhira, our oldest mystical text we have in our tradition. And let's see here what it says about our month. It says, he, the creator, Ainsof, made the letter Vav king over thought. He bound a crown to it and he combined one with the other. And with them, he formed Taurus and the universe and the ER in the year. 
if you happen to have been in this class before or you are familiar with Safety at Sierra, you'll know. And if you won't, then um, this is you know, the first time you're seeing it. Safety at Sierra is a little confusing. It's sparse and it's not linear. Um, it's actually it has uh, elements of magic in it. And it certainly reads like a book of spells in some places. So what's going on here is that it's telling us certain qualities associated with our month. And every month has a letter of the alphabet and a thing that people do like eating or sleeping or getting angry. And, and it also has a part of the body and also a constellation. So our month has the letter, the Hebrew letter Vav, the sixth letter of the alphabet, and it has the, the activity of thought. So again, compared to other months, which are like action, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, thought, thought, hear, her. That's the quality, the activity of our month. Now, we're not gonna go into the other um, aspects of our month listed there, but we have plenty to work with in the time we have, just dealing with vav and thought. But the they, others are also relevant, but just, you know, we have to, have to narrow our focus a little bit. Let's see a little bit about those things. And then again, we'll come back together. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. No pun intended. So Rav Sadoka Cohen, the great Hasidic master, says in pre Sadik on, on, on our month, says uh, the distinction between two words for thought we have, we have hirohur, that's the one we use in our month, and then we have machshava, which is actually the word for thought that's more common, it's more common. He says machshava is in the brain and hirohur is in the heart. So he, he's directing us specifically to really focus on our feelings. That's really interesting because hirohur, the word for thinking that Seyfi Yitzhira uses for our month, is often also specifically associated with thinking about things, meaning not only feeling. So he's choosing to say there's an emphasis on, on feeling. that He's, I think, really uh, being quite innovative in, in, in stressing that. And I, I think we're going to see in the next few sources why that is, why he, why he wants to emphasize that the work we're doing this month is very heart-centered. Let's see, let's see a bit more. So he points out, and this, this the next few things is actually not things that he's innovating, but he's just a good place to get it. He says, Vav, the letter Vav, the letter of our month, the sixth letter of the alphabet, Vav relates to the hooks of the pillars of the tabernacle. And its shape is also that of the hooks, for it binds and joins two things together. So this is really fun. The word Vav, because it's the name of a letter, but it's also a word, the word Vav means hook. And the shape of the letter also is a hook. I'm just going to come back together and put it in the chat just so everyone can see super clearly what I'm talking about. Oh, it won't work because it, it, that's really unfortunate. It writes it differently. It's a different kind of font. So you know what? Let's go back to the, uh, the source sheet and at least, at least you can see it there. So you, see, you can see how the letter Vav is written there and that word Vave, right? So you see just one Vav looks like a hook. And again, the word Vav means hook. And, and so, and it's used in the Torah to mean that. So on, on so basically everything about Vav is hooking and connecting things. So as it says, it binds, as he says, it binds and joins two things together. And he explains Vav is the central bar, which, which extends from end to end, from the uppermost Keter to the quality of Malchut, which is called world. What's he talking about? He's saying, in the Mishkan, which is the portable temple or tabernacle that our ancient spiritual ancestors traveled around with in the desert, in the wilderness, in that, in that tabernacle, there was a central bar. And that is the thing which holds everything together. And now there's a lot of Midrashic, a lot of early rabbinic material, which says that we are microcosm of the whole world. And so is the Mishkan, the tabernacle. And therefore, the Mishkan... And our bodies are microcosms of each other. Like they, it's like a reflection of us. So the central bar of the Mishkan also is a reflection of the central bar of the tree of life. And just to flick back up to that diagram that we had at the beginning, if you, what he's talking about is this line that goes all the way down the middle from Keter at the top all the way down to Shekhinah or Malka at the bottom. You see there's a line going all the way down through it. That is what holds it together. And please pay attention to what is right at the center of that central line the center of the whole tree of life is Tiferet. Tiferet means beauty or harmony, balance. Uh, also, it's called Rechamim or compassion. That's one of its other names and qualities. So we're going to talk a lot now about Tiferet and, and its role in all of this. 
because uh, that's really at the heart of everything here and it's certainly at the heart and at the center of Vav and actually heart is the operative word because each of these sefirot, each of these qualities relates to a part of the body and Tiferet is the heart. So that again is why Rav Sadak is talking about Hirhu, the quality or activity of our month being the work of the heart. So let's go back to him and see what else he's saying about it. So he told us that Hirhu is the work of the heart. He told us that Vav, the letter for our month, is that which connects everything together. And then the next source over the page, he says, as it says in the Zohar, all ten sefirot relate to the letters of the four-letter divine name. That's Yud and Hey and Vav and Hey. Havaya, that Havaya is like how, how uh, it's written or said when people don't want to say the actual name. If they rearrange the letters into different order. The Yud and He are Chochma and Bina. The Vav is the six middle attributes. And the final He is Malchut. So let's just flick back up to our diagram and see what he's talking about. He's saying in, if uh, Yud and He and Vav and He are mapped onto this diagram, then Yud is Chochma, He, the first He is Bina. And then the Vav is this whole middle section here, again, which again centers on Tiferet, essentially the upper body, the torso. And then the final bottom uh, sifra of Shekhinah or Malchut is the final He of the four letter name of God, which relates to manifestation. So we again are working here in the realm of Vav, in that which connects the upper to the lower. So whether we're thinking about it in terms of God's name or in terms of the Mishkan or in terms of the human body, that, that's our work on, on all these different levels of significance that the Kabbalah works on. Very nice, you might be saying, but what does this have to do with the price of fish and specifically with my life? Well, fortunately, we have the Kabbalists and then we have the Hasidic masters who bring it down to our everyday work in more psychological language. So we have a great example of that here from the Be'er Mayim Chaim. He says, when a person turns, sorry, when a person merits to turn a negative character trait to good, that is much better and when someone only serves God with their positive traits. This is a big principle of the Hasidic movement. They, they actually looked, um, if people were just completely righteous all the time and never did anything wrong, the Hasidic tradition is actually quite suspicious of them and pa patronizing towards them, condescending towards them, because it actually says that, well, if they never did anything wrong, then they never really know the fun of do and the passion that you can have sinning. And then you can never really do anything good because you never really have any enthusiasm for anything. So that's, that's, you know, that's one of the main, as an important teaching from the founders of the Hasidic movement, from the Magad of Mezrich and the Baal Shem Tov. So it's much better, they're saying, to turn our negative character traits to good than to only ever be someone who does good. And now they're going to talk about it in terms of the heart, as our sages say on the verse, and you shall love the eternal, your God, with all your heart and with your soul and all your might. So that's a verse from the Shema, one of our main prayers that may be familiar to some of you. Well, we should love God with all our heart, all our soul and all our might. Now, our sages in the Talmud, in the references here, Barakot 54a, our sages say that when the verse says we should love God with all our heart, it means with your two drives or your two inclinations, your drive to do good and your drive to do evil. That's our Yitzhah Tov and our Yitzhah Hara, our, our two desires, you might say, our drive to do our evil, our, our desire to do good and our desire to do evil. So it's funny because we do actually, as you may know, kind of have two hearts. Our heart can be split into two. Um, and the, the, um, you know, the Kabbalists actually saw that as like a good side and a bad side. So, but the ancient rabbinic tradition is clear, even though we might think, you know, one is better than the other or one is dominant or whatever that means, we're meant to serve with both. We're very, very clear that the, the Yitzhah Sahara, this thing which, you know, we call our drive to do evil is not something we deny or push away or suppress. We're meant to integrate it. It's a very, very important rabbinic teaching, which you know, only becomes more prominent in the Hasidic teachings, but it goes, goes all the way back to the ancient rabbis. We are, we are not here to suppress our animalistic side. We're here to integrate it. And he goes on, here too, it is good when someone is sunk in the depths of impurity, then they merit to ascend from Mitzrayim, Egypt, and turn every one of their negative traits to good. So this is what we're doing. We are not trying to deny the parts of us which are not perfect. We are merely trying to integrate them. We're trying to actually turn towards them and welcome them because that is how ultimately we're going to integrate them. So I'm going to come back to all of you and see if anyone has anything to add. Oh, great. We see a few things here. 
Um, oh, quite a lot of things there. Okay. Uh, Averell says the tribe connected with Yad is Issachar. Any idea why? Um, I, my guess would be that Issachar is connected with um, learning Torah and that this is a month of preparing to receive the Torah at Mount Sinai because that's what's going to happen at the festival soon after this month on Shavuot. Um, it's funny, there are different systems connecting different tribes to different months. Um, so there are, there are therefore different reasons for, for all of those connections. Um, Rosa says, is that where the myth of the seventh sun go into literature? I don't know about that. I'm sorry, Rosa. Can't speak to that. Um, Avril says no part of the body was listed. Oh, is it not? Um, let's go back and see. Uh, say for your Sarah. Oh, that's, you know what? I must have cut that one out just to shorten it, but um, and for, neglected that. Sorry, it's it's there in all of them. Or maybe I, yeah, no, it, I, yeah, I must have just taken it out to shorten it. Apologies. Um, so I'm sorry. I can if you contact me after, I'll tell you what it says. If you can't find it online, very happily. Um, Barry says, oh, something I'm not wrong. Okay. Uh, Vav, right, Betsy points out, thank you, Betsy. I may have neglected to say, um, <laughs> as well as all those layers of meaning, that Vav is a uh, connecting word and it looks like a hook and it means a hook. It also means and. So uh, that was maybe the uh, thing that was so obviously like on my mind, I forgot to actually say it. So thank you very much for saying that, Betsy. So yeah, Vav means and. So it's the ultimate connector, right? So whenever we put Vav in front of a word in Hebrew, it means and this, right? Uh, Steve says, just thinking about the significance of Israeli Declaration of Independence in the month of Iyar in 1948. Yes, Steve, uh, you know, I can say that these dates, you know, when we live in tune with the calendar, when these things happen on the, these dates and then we notice them, then uh, it takes on the significance that we already have those layers of meaning in the calendar. And, we, and uh, certainly I resonate with that. Uh, side note on that from... So Ferret Julie Seltzer. The Hebrew letters evolved from pre-alphabetic symbols that represented objects. In the case of the Vav, hook. Thank you, Julie. That's awesome. Ah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So um, yeah, it's not just uh, like a kind of coincidence or like a later projection. It's actually there from before it. Beautiful. Uh, brilliant. Okay, let's keep let's keep going, friends. We're gonna see now. We've, I hope, uh, you know, done some good building of the foundation of like, what is the Omer and what is the spiritual work at this time and how to approach it, I hope. And now we're going to see a little bit specifically what we can do in the week of Tiferet that we are going into. And then the weeks that follow, the weeks of Netzach, Chod and Yesod, which make up this month. Now, as I said, like each of these qualities could be a whole class and there is a whole class in other things I teach. So I really want to encourage people to please contact me if you would like more material on any of these, because I have them. I have recorded classes and handouts. I'm very, very happy to share. And, um, you know, this is really just a tiny, tiny taste that we have time for in this one class on so many different things. So we're going to talk about Tiferet, first of all, the quality of this current week and the archetype of Tiferet, because every, every one of these qualities has a patriarch associated with it. Um, and later on, interestingly, a matriarch too, but mostly in most sources, a patriarch. The, the patriarch associated with Tiferet is Jacob, Yaakov. So this is a key moment in Jacob's life. And we're gonna see, I'm gonna explain a little bit how, it, how the tradition relates it to Tiferet and to our work of Tiferet. So Genesis 28, 11 says, and he, Jacob, arrived at the place and lodged there because the sun had set. And he took some of the stones of the place and placed them at his head, and he lay down in that place. So Jacob is on the run at this point. He's on the run actually from his own home because his brother Esau, Esau, wants to kill him because uh, he tricked his father into giving, Jacob tricked his father into giving him the blessing of the firstborn uh, as a whole long com complicated story in itself. And uh, he's on the run, he's alone in the middle of the desert, and he arrives at the place, this mysterious place, which our tradition has many things to say about. And he slept there, and he takes the stones of the place, and he puts them at his head, 
to use as some kind of pillow or protection and he lay down in that place. And Rashi, our great French medieval commentator says, this is what's below the, the little uh, mark there, the commentary from Rashi, and place them at his head. What does that mean, says Rashi? He arranged them in the form of a drain pipe around his head because he feared the wild beasts. They, the stones, started quarreling with one another. This is what, this is what stones argue about, apparently. This is what stones said, carrying on. One said, let the righteous man lay his head on me. And another one said, let him lay his head on me. Immediately, the Holy One, blessed be he, made them into one stone. This is why it is stated in verse 18 later, and he took the stone in the singular that he had placed at his head. So what's going on? When Jacob goes to bed, there are multiple stones. The text is very clear. He takes several stones and puts them at or around his head. But in the morning, it does say very clearly in the text, in the Torah itself, that there's one stone that, that he had placed at his head. So, you know, is this just like some kind of weird error by a very amateurish and sloppy author and lack of editor? Or, you know, in the rabbinic view, in the Midrashic view, there were multiple stones and they magically somehow became one in the night. And the rationale given is that it's because they all wanted to be under his head. So how does this relate to Tiferet and our quality of, our quality of this time? Tiferet, one of the key things about it is that, it's, well, first of all, as I mentioned before, it's connected to the heart and, and therefore love and the, and the openness to a relationship with the world. That's very, very important. But specifically, it's about connection between what's below and what's above, between material, physical things and spiritual things, and between singularity and multiplicity. So, for example, chesed is about oneness, I mentioned before, and gavura is about boundaries and multiplicity. And when you get the healthy synthesis of them right, then you get healthy tefera. So in this, in this story, you've got lots and lots of things fighting among themselves. When they learn to come together harmoniously in love, because they all want to be connected to this beautiful person, then you, then you get a healthy manifestation of Tiferet. And Jacob is a person who goes through the world having that kind of that relationship with the world, that he is in love with the world and the world is in love with him. So actually in the same story, the, the, the sun and the earth are actually doing supernatural things because they want to be in an intimate relationship with him. Like the land is folding under his feet to bring him to the right place. And the sun is setting early to, Brit to bring him to the right place at the right time. All these things are happening because the world is in love with him and he's walking around in love with the world. So he, he, for him, he is a connection between the microcosm and the macrocosm. And actually the best example of this is in the same story, in his famous dream of the ladder, Jacob's ladder. This is what the verse says, 28, 12. And he dreamed, Jacob dreamed, and behold, a ladder standing on the ground as its top reached to heaven. And behold, angels of God were ascending and descending on it. No clearer illustration possible and no clearer model, which has been used by artists and dreamers throughout the centuries possible. A ladder, the, the Torah says specifically, the ladder is standing on the ground and it's mutsav artsa. It is, it is firmly established on, in the, this material, physical reality we're in of separation and duality and all the things that define our reality here on, on, in this planet and this world. And yet, Rosho Magia Hashemayama goes up to infinity, right? It's completely unbounded where it goes to. So the, the Midrashic material, the commentaries offer many, many different interpretations, including that he, Jacob, and therefore, of course, we also, anyone, all people, are the ladder. We, of course, can have our feet grounded in this material reality and yet have unlimited consciousness, unlimited potential of where we're going. And Tiferet, the heart, is the bridge between them, right? It's the ladder, it's actually the ladder itself. It's the center of the ladder. Going back to our diagram for the Tiferet, which is often, this is often called a ladder and used as a ladder and, project, and the ladder is often projected onto this. If this is a ladder, and Tiferet is the very heart of it, right? Tiferet is a crucial role in that ladder of being the connection between the microcosm and the macrocosm, etc. cetera. So that, that's as much as we're gonna talk about Tiferet today. Again, if you're interested in more, please contact me for more. I'm very, very happy to talk about it. Oh, actually, there's one more piece on Tiferet here, actually. 
Oh, well, actually, two. Great. I was generous with the ferret. Um, let's see if we have time for all of this. Um, I thought I'd cut this out for time, but let, let's try and do it. So this is Rashi, again, our famous French medieval commentator. Then this is one of his first comments on the whole Torah, which is quite famous, in, you know, if you're into that kind of thing, in the world of biblical commentators. Like most of his commentary, it's based on ancient rabbinic teachings based on the Midrash Genesis Rabbi, as it says there, but he, uh, he spins it a tiny bit. So it says, in the beginning, it was God's intention to create the universe with the attribute of justice, but he perceived that the world would not endure. So he preceded it with the divine attribute of mercy and joined it with the divine attribute of justice. Now, what does all that mean? It means God thought, if you're going to make a universe, you've got to have rules, right? You've got to have like Newton's laws and thermodynamics and gravity and all the, all the laws which make things work. And of course, you've got to have moral laws too, right? Right and wrong, good and bad. If you do good, you get, get good. If you do bad, you get bad. That's, that's the attribute of justice, din, which is identified with the sefira of Gevura, the second sefira. So we had chesed first, loving kindness, then Gevura boundaries or severity. So Gevura is also called din, justice. Like judging between things is also like putting boundaries on them and being severe. But then, he, then God realized a world made only with justice, severity, boundaries, separation, just isn't going to endure, just not going to last. That universe is doomed to fail pretty soon. Why exactly, he doesn't say, but presumably because the beings in that universe cannot take that reality. It's too harsh. There needs to be compassion. So hence, preceded it, God realized he had to proceed it with the divine attribute of mercy or compassion, rachamim, actually means, actually means womb mercy. Rechem means womb. So God, God actually changes from being like this strict judge, it's like, I'm going to run the world just with law, to being like this mother, this birthing mother, saying, I'm going to run the world with a healthy mixture of law, but also firstly, actually, because it's the attribute of mercy is going to precede the attribute of judgment. Firstly, I'm going to actually have to birth this world into being with womb mercy, with womb compassion. And otherwise, the world just won't endure. And compassion has to come first. So that, again, is, is central to uh, the work of Tiferet. What, what is it that's going to connect this ladder between micro and macro, between physical and spiritual, between oneness and multiplicity? The, according to the Kabbalists, it's Tefera, it is also compassion. It's also Rachamin. That's another name for it. So that's key. And next source, I'm really glad I included it actually. It's very important from the Zohar about all of these different qualities. And it says something really important about them. So Rabbi Simon said, Isaac emerged from Chesed, and so with all of them. Din, that's Gevura, judgment, emerged from Rachamin, and Rachamin from Din. So Isaac is, Isaac is associated with, with Din or Gavura and is saying he, he came from out from the other one and the other one came out from that other one and this other one came out from that other one. And, and this is really true. This is the, the Sephirot are all, are all in symbiotic relationship. If you go back to our diagram, just flicking up to the top again, you'll see these lines between them. All of these lines portray relationship between all of them. They're all in dynamic interrelationship all the time. Great. So what does the Zohar say about that? says it has been taught all this everything we're saying about these qualities is only from our perspective and this is just how it looks to us but meaning in other words you know we're talking about chesed and gavura and deferrah and all these qualities don't confuse this with actual reality it's just a map it's just a way that we can talk about reality for above the zohar goes on everything is perfectly balanced not changing or changeable. As it is written, I, the eternal, have not changed. Rabbi Yehuda said, all these lamps shine from one, and upon one they depend. They are completely one and must not be separated. Meaning we talk about the Sephirot, we separate them to talk about them, say this quality and that quality, but actually don't forget they're all just reflections of a oneness and never make the mistake of treating them as a separate entity. In fact, I would go further, I would put it in slightly different language. I would say, you can never actually relate to a sephira on its own. It just, it, it's, if we do, it's actually a delusion. It's actually like we're, we're essentially making an idol. Sephira only exist in interrelationship with each other as a reflection of some greater reality um, that 
the creator, the aims of, and the universe uh, beyond that they are reflections of and portals to and from. Let's go on just a tiny bit more. Oh, great. I was very generous with the ferret, more than I realized. I changed the whole thing uh, today and I see now what I did. So one more into ferret and then one more to, to wrap up on Netzach and Hod and then I'll come back together. There'll be time to hear your questions and comments. So this source from the Moor and I am one of my favorite Hasidic Rebbe's, the Shinobla Rebbe, actually gives us a spiritual practice to do during the week of Tiferet that we're in right now. It says, um, when we say the Shema, he's pointing out that the Shema contains within it different names of God. We have in it yud hey vav hey, that we pronounce as Adonai, the four-letter name. That's connected with compassion. We also have say in the Shema, Eloheinu, which is connected to Elohim, which is connected to din, judgment, severity. So we are, sing- we are saying in the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We are saying specifically the God of compassion and the God of judgment are actually one. And he's saying that's our practice. As he says, I'm just skipping down to the fourth line, because the reciter accepts the blessed divinity of both, both the God of compassion and the God of judgment, as in Shema Yisrael, Hashem Lakeinu Hashem Echad, the eternal our God, the eternal is one. Whether he interacts with them as Havaya, again, that's compassion, or Eloheinu, judgment, everything is the eternal and his loving oneness. May he be blessed. So in other words, when we say and we really try and believe God, whatever you're called, the ain't of the mystery, what, whether I'm experiencing you as compassion or whether I'm experiencing the more harsh judging side of you right now, it's all one. When we say that and try and bring that into our lives, he says, as he said in the last two lines, when a person serves with this doubt, that means awareness, when a person serves with this awareness, judgment is also made into compassion. So this is a very controversial claim and you know, obviously not, not one I, I, uh, I put out there uh, as myself putting out there, but this, this is very representative of the early Hasidic masters. They really did say this and believe this and teach this. And, you know, it was part of why the movement spread to millions of people, that it worked for a lot of people. When we try and see the good in things, when we try and see the good, even in things which are very hard, even in suffering, that actually changes reality. And that may be your experience, that may not be your experience. I'm sure, you know, everyone on this, uh, everyone in this class has a different experience of that. And, you know, obviously, depending on what's going on in our lives right now, that may or may not seem accessible or hard or ludicrous or right or wrong whatever you experience it so again i'm not not offering a stance on that but just wanted to put out there as uh, an invitation for practice as whether or not we take it to its extreme i think you know whether or not we would go all the way with it the idea that i think is one most of us would agree i hope that it could be helpful it could be helpful to try and see the good in challenges that we're having again even if we don't take it to the extreme and just gonna offer the last teaching I have here, and then we'll then we'll come back together. I'd love to hear your input on all of this. So a very famous teaching again, if you're into that kind of thing, um, from great Hasidic Rabbi Reb Simcha Bunim Shishcha, and uh, this is really an amazing encapsulation of the work of Netzach and Hod. And I would love to, you know, I wish we had more time to go Netzach and Hod. And again, please contact me if you'd like materials on that second hod because i have much of it uh, but this one teaching does encapsulate a lot of the work we need to do with it so it says everyone needs two pockets so they can reach into one or the other depending on the need in one pocket should be a note saying for my sake was the world created from the mishnah and in the other pocket should be a note saying the verse i am but dust and ashes so the whole world was made for me on this hand on the other hand I, I'm just dust and ashes. Many people err, he says, and use the opposite pocket to the one that they need. Meaning, a lot of the time, we, we are creatures of habit and momentum, and we're on a roll. So if we're, we spiral. So if I'm thinking I'm amazing, I'm likely to have confirmation bias for other things that say I'm amazing. But if I'm being down on myself, beating myself up, being depressed, then I'm likely to look with confirmation bias for things that make me feel even worse. So he's saying, Whatever spiral you're in, try and balance it out with one from the other one. Don't just confirm what you already feel, challenge it with a healthy balance. Netzach is 
again, like persistence and determination and affirming, whereas hod is humility and remembering to make space for other possibilities. In brief, let's come back together. That was a, that was a lot, that, that last little bit. So I'd love to hear what you guys uh, have to say about it. Um, okay, there's a few things here. Uh, Taurus symbol is that of a bull. Bulls are notorious for their stubbornness. Is this a trait we have to work on during ER? You know, Harriet, I honestly haven't seen that discussed in the sources, but it does seem to me that if we're going to do the spiritual work of you know, heart-based healing of these character traits, that, that that's a good place to start. Yeah, that's, that does seem pretty central to everything we're talking about. So yeah, def definitely uh, that resonates with me. Uh, Barry says, anything to share about where that place might be? Uh, yes, just Barry, contact me after class and I'll, and I'll send you very happily what, that where the, the body place of uh, safety at Sarah uh, says connected to the man. Sorry, I don't know what it is. Betsy says, who is the matriarch woman connected to Ferret? Um, there are different schemas. The one that I think is most accurate connects Ruth to Ferret because I think Shavuot is connected in many schemas to Shavu to Tiferet and Ruth that is the heroine of Shavuot and I really think she embodies Tiferet in so many ways in the story of Ruth the Miguel that we read at that time again um, there are a few good resources I have on that like lists of the different women and matriarchs connected to Tiferet please send me an email and I'll be very happy to send it to you um, Elaine says uh, lovely Midrash at the beginning of time God had many worlds and destroyed many while he was sitting on the throne of justice then the angels told God to sit on the throne of mercy. From mercy, the earth was created. Beautiful, Helene. Yeah, I love that. So that's uh, obviously resonant with that one we saw together. I uh, love that. Uh, Lisan says, I looked it up. The word Tiferet is derived from the Hebrew word Pe'er, meaning beauty. The attribute of Tiferet blends Chesed and Gevura so that a proper mixture of the two can produce a bearable revelation of Chesed to finite created beings. Beautiful. Thanks so much, Leon. That is really beautiful. Uh, apologies if I never actually said exactly what the word meant literally. I kind of said beauty and harmony and beauty. It's, these things will have so many layers of meaning. Um, Julie, do we have a couple more minutes to keep going through the comments? Is, sure that, is that okay? If you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm fine. I just want, I want to um, make sure I take in everyone's comments. Rachel says, uh, my heart. Oh, you're so, thank you, Rachel. You're so welcome. Kind words. Uh, and Meredith too. Uh, how does all this tie to ER specifically, Lizanne? Really good question. Okay. So, yeah, good. Let, let's tie it all together. Sefi Yitzhira says, the, the oldest mystical text says, this is the month for working on our Hihurim. And the Kabbalists say this is the month specifically for working on these character traits, these qualities of the divine, these Sifi right inside us. And the, the letter of our month is Vav. And a lot of, a lot of these things, the Hihur and the Vav, and these qualities all center on the heart. So our emotional center, our center of consciousness, our heart, mind, as I said, but our thoughts and our feelings. So in other words, our work this month is to work on these qualities in ourselves, specifically in the realm of our thoughts and our feelings, like to notice what we're thinking and feeling and try and refine them. So, you know, like I'm, I'm finding it very easy today to feel compassion or I'm feeling hatred, anger, jealousy, shame, and so on. And just to start from a place of honest noticing of that, and then to work with that, to, to refine it, to, to be, you know, okay, maybe I want to feel more of X and less of Y. Maybe I, you know, maybe I want to um, make myself a person who is more prone to certain emotions than others. So just starts with just an honest noticing, I think, of how we relate to those qualities. Uh, in sociological theory terms, symbolic interactionism. Oh, I love that, Meredith. Thank you. That's, that's juicy. Um, Raymond says, when we look to the good, we have peace, joy, and love in our hearts. Raymond, that's a beautiful articulation of uh, what I was talking about before. Uh, and, you know, again, I want to acknowledge you know, the, that's very challenging if we take it to its extreme, but certainly that's the, uh, the practice being offered there by the Rebbe's. Um, and then some wonderful, kind thank you comments. And, ah, right, Teferit is Jacob or Stephen. Yes, Teferit, the, the, the archetype or the patriarch associated with Teferit is Jacob. He, according to Kabbalah, he was able to embody that quality. Not all the time, but he was able to bring it into the world in a certain way. Um, yeah, 
each, each sephira is connected to a different one. Um, everything becomes clearer through comparison with its alternative. Justice and compassion are such alternatives and great to contemplate before Shavuot, but we all say Nasavadishma. Exactly. Beautifully put, Elaine. So I, actually, it's a really helpful articulation. I was trying to say before, you know, none of these exist in isolation. It's only in seeing how they interrelate in our lives, like that we can really learn about them and purify them. So, you know, how does my sense of humility relate to my sense of boundaries, for example, right? Or just like, how does my sense of kindness relate to my sense of determination? These are the kind of questions we can learn from in this time. Um, but lovely. Thank you everyone so much. I really, uh, really appreciate all the questions and comments. And thanks Julie and my Jewish learning as always. And uh, as I said many times, there's so much more to share on this theme. I'd be very, very happy to hear from you if you want to be in touch about it. Thank you so much, Rabbi Silverstein. Um, and thank you, of course, everyone for being here today. Uh, I also wanted to let you know when the next class is. So um, the next month is Sivan. No, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, the date will be Wednesday, May 12th. And it looks like we're going to have to shift the time for this uh, day because we have another class that afternoon. So it will be at 11 a.m. Um, Eastern time, unless you hear otherwise, but we would announce that very, very soon. And the recording will be up by tomorrow on the, that same um, playlist that we've been using. We'll also send that out in a, in a follow-up email tomorrow. And I think those were all of the announcements. Um, so again, thank you very much. We will see you next month. Um, and hopefully everyone will be able to join again.